in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus said that my words are spirit and they are life. Jesus said that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will endure forever. That men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. His word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against him. His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. His word is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. His word is undeniable, irrefutable, absolute, and never changing. His word is forever relevant, life-giving, everlasting, and the foundation for our lives. His word is here today, so let's open our hearts and our minds. Let's put our hands together and get excited because we're about to be changed by God's word. Well, I hope y'all came ready because I've got a word. I don't got a message. I don't got three points. I just got a word. Are you ready? The Holy Spirit exploded this word in my heart. I hope that, that and pray that I could deliver it the way that he has delivered it unto me. So we're just going to open up with prayer, and then we're going to jump right into the word. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together in a free nation, Father. We don't live under tyranny or fear. To gather like this, we are in a place of freedom. Your house is a place of protection and freedom. I pray right now that you would stir and move in each and every one of our hearts. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear that which your Holy Spirit would speak. Jesus, be magnified, be glorified through your holy word. And everybody said, Amen. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. That's where we're going to begin. Today is a very special day. Today is just a week before Jesus was crucified 2,000 years ago. Today is a day that I want you to know that Jesus was thinking about you 2,000 years ago today. He built a message within that day to be able to say to you how much he believes you, how much he loves you, and how his mercy endures forever. 2,000 years ago, can you imagine if you knew the day you were going to die? And not just die, but be crucified. Have the flesh ripped from your bones. Have your beard pulled out of your face, have a crown of thorns pressed into your skull to be mocked, to be spit on, to be doubted, to be criticized, to be shouted at. Can you imagine the anticipation that was within Jesus? Because yes, he was all God, but he was also all man. And he was dealing with the soulful realm as well as the spiritual realm, a week leading in to his crucifixion, and he built a message 2,000 years ago for us today to walk away encouraged and strengthened and walking and abounding in his mercy more and more. Are you ready for that? In Luke chapter 19, verse 1, this is Jesus' Wednesday before the week of his crucifixion, what we would call the Holy Week or the Passion Week, the week before he was crucified, the week before he died, was buried, and rose again. And that Wednesday, he chose to do some specific miracles, to walk in the specific unction and power of the Holy Spirit, I believe as a demonstration, not just to those that were living then, but even to us that are living now. Jesus shows us some stuff about who he was, why he came, and why it's so critically important for each and every one of us to embrace him in his fullness. On that Wednesday, before the Passion Week, Jesus decided to go to a city named Jericho. Are you familiar with Jericho? Out of the Old Testament, when Joshua and the whole army of Israel were called by God to take Israel, and before they were going there, they passed through the Philistine land, and in that Philistine land laid the most barricaded city on the planet. Two walls built back to back, thicker than one can imagine. High, the Bible says, they were as high as the sky. In other words, they were so tall that you couldn't see a limit to it. 
It looked like it was invincible. It looked like there was no way that it could be surmountable. It looked like it was impossible. It looked like it was the end for their journey. How many of y'all ever felt like that in your marriage or in your faith or in your finances or, or in your relationships or in your children's lives? You have felt like it's insurmountable. I can't overcome it. I can't get past it. I can't move beyond it. It's too big for me. And I say, good. It's good when it's too big for you. It's good when it's too big for me because when it's too big for us, that means only God can take the credit. And it's only God and God alone that we can put our trust in to depend on to make a way for us to go through. Are y'all ready now? Luke chapter 19, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was very rich. He was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on the account of the size of the crowd, he could not because he was so small in stature. So he ran on ahead. He climbed up into a sycamore tree just to see him, for he was about to pass by that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, Hurry up and come on down, for I must stay at your house today. Here's the first lesson of what Jesus is wanting us to hear. On the week before the Holy Week, he wants you to know he sees you. No matter your stature, no matter your situation, no matter what somebody else has spoken over you, no matter the word curses that have been brought against you, no matter even the lack of faith that you may have in yourself. Maybe it's not even that. Maybe it's just that you don't even understand the fullness of the potential that God has placed within you. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you've been discarded. Maybe you've been abandoned. Maybe you've been divorced. Maybe you have been abused. But Jesus is here today to tell you, I see you. I see you when you press through the crowd. When you make your way, Wednesday nights are our sycamore tree. Wednesday nights are the night where you come out and you say, it's not just about a weekend service for me, but I want more of Jesus. I want to see Jesus more. I want to know Jesus more. And that lesson for all of us is that he sees you. He knows who you are. So he heard and he came down, received him joyfully. And when they saw it, They all grumbled, all the religious folks, all the Gentiles, all the non-believers. The scripture says they grumbled in anger. They were so ticked off. How is this short man who climbed the tree getting all this kind of favor? And then listen to what they said. They said he's going to be a guest in the man who is the chief of all sinners. Speaking of Jesus now. And he's telling them that they're so ticked off. And Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restored it. I will restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also now, I could say, is a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the laws. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. He was a wealthy man who robbed many people of their money. He robbed the government of its money. But when he was in the presence of Jesus, he was not going to allow that sin to hold him back from being that which God had ultimately called him to be. And when he realized that Jesus saw him, then his heart burst with joy. And he was ready. He was ready to come into the life with Jesus. Are you ready tonight to walk into a deeper level in your life with Jesus? Because he sees you. He sees everything about you. He knows your hurts. He knows your pains. He knows your circumstances. He knows your situations. He knows what you're facing. He knows the faith that has been weak at times. He knows how you have stumbled. He knows how you have fallen. That's why he placed it in his word 5,000 years ago that the righteous may fall down seven, but they stand up eight. He was telling you then, I've got your back. I'm in your corner. Nothing is too big for me. I'm with you all the way. 
The next thing that Jesus did, we find in Mark chapter 10 and verse 46, it begins. And then when Jesus reached into Jericho, and Jesus and his disciples were about to leave town, a large crowd had followed him. And a blind beggar named Bartimaeus was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard the name of Jesus and heard that Jesus was nearby, he starts to do something amazing. He starts to do something incredible that gains the attention of Jesus and gives him the breakthrough that he had been waiting on. Before we get to that, I want to take you now to Joshua chapter 6 because there's a parallel here with Jesus returning to Jericho. When Jesus went into Jericho, I believe it was bringing something full circle from the time that the Israelites themselves went into Jericho. This one it says in verse 6 of chapter 6 of Joshua. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go in nor out. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all of its strong warriors. And you and your fighting men, they should, now, they should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the Ark of the Covenant, each carrying a ram's horn. Seven priests will walk ahead of the covenant, the pastors, the, the, the leaders serving the people and going first and not expecting somebody to do something that they're not willing to do themselves. On the seventh day, you are to march around the city seven times with the priest blowing the horns. When you hear the priest give one long blast of the ram's horn, I want you to have all the people shout as loud as they can. And then the walls that stand before you, the walls that are keeping you from your breakthrough, the walls that are in between you and your destiny, the walls that are standing there trying to intimidate you, trying to psych you out, trying to make you think you're not good enough, big enough, or bad enough, those walls will come down. And the people can charge straight in to the city. Now let's back in. Let's go back into Mark. When they reached Jericho and Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. And a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, he was sitting on the side of the road. When he heard that Jesus was nearby, he began to shout. Hear this now. What did God tell the Israelites to do when they walked around that city the seventh time? If they wanted to receive their breakthrough in Jericho, if they wanted their destiny, what did they need to do? They needed to. Yeah. Well, about half of you. They needed to. Yeah. And then what did, what did blind Bartimaeus do when he needed his breakthrough, when he was ready and sick and tired of being sick and tired and wanted that which God had promised him. What did he do? Yes, he did. We're going back into Joshua. So Joshua called together the priest, and he said, Take up the ark of the Lord's covenant and assign seven priests to walk in front of it, each carrying a ram's horn. When he gave the order to the people, he said it like this, march around the town and the armed men will lead the way in front of the ark of the Lord. After Joshua spoke to the people, the seven priests with the ram's horn started to march around in the presence of the Lord, blowing the horns as they marched. And the ark of the Lord's covenant followed behind them. Do you know where the ark of the Lord's covenant resides today? Do you know that archaeologists are still looking for it? The Ark of the Lord's Covenant, if you're not familiar with what it was, it was, a, it was a built apparatus that contained certain things like Aaron's rod and certain things that were placed inside of the Ark of the Covenant. But what was most important was is it carried the glory of the Lord. 
When the priests carried it, they had to carry it with these long poles of cedar posts so that they would not touch the glory of the Lord. If they would touch the Ark of the Covenant, they would die on the spot. Do you know where that Ark is? I know exactly where it is. Archaeologists are looking for it desperately. Everybody, religious people are searching for it everywhere. Even non-believers believe it existed, and they're, they're hunting the earth for it. And I know exactly where it is. And it's right here. It's right here inside of each and every one of us. That's when we sing that song. The veil tore before him. The veil was the curtain that stopped anyone normal from going beyond the point of holy of holies and being able to get to the ark. It was kept behind the veil. And when Jesus died on the cross, the temple was shook with a great earthquake, and the veil was torn in two, representing that the glory of God would no longer reside within a box and be untouchable by his people, but the glory of God would reside in you. It would be inside of his people. This is so good. I wish I wasn't preaching. I'd amen myself a few times. Some of the armed men, they marched in front of the priest with the horns, and some behind the ark. And with the priest continuing blowing the horns, Joshua gave a command to God's people, do not shout yet. Don't even say a word. Not a single word from any of you until I tell you to shout. Then shout with everything that you have. And so the ark of the Lord was carried around the town once a day, and then everyone turned to spend the night in the camp. And Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests again carried the ark of the Lord. The seven priests with the ram's horns, they marched in front of the ark of the Lord, blowing their horns. Again, the armed men marched both in front of the priest and in front of the ark with the horns behind them and the ark of the Lord. All of this time, the priests were blowing their horns. On the second day, they again marched around the town once and returned to camp, and they followed this pattern for six days. But on the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn. They marched around the town as they had done before, but this time, they went around the town seven times. The seventh time around, seven, 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 all the way through God's number of completion, perfection. The seventh time around, as the priest shouted the long blast of their horns, Joshua then commanded the people, now shout for the glory of God has given you this city. Are you hearing this now? Can we go back into Mark? When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was nearby, he began to shout. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, the crowd said to him. They yelled at him. They mocked him. But he only shouted louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, Tell him to come here. How many people in your life have told you to be quiet? They don't want to hear about your Jesus. They don't want to hear about your faith. They don't want to hear about your testimony. They don't want to hear how many demons have been shouting in your ear. How many demons have been whispering in your ear. How many devils have come to your doorstep and told you that your marriage is over. How many demons have come to your doorstep. How many have crept in your bedroom and told you that you will never break out of the financial duress that you're in. How many people have come to you. How many enemies have come to you. How many demons have come to you and told you your children will never serve God. And they don't care what the scripture says. That if you have raised them in the way of the Lord. That when they're older they will walk in 
in that way? How many people have come to you and told you you will never break that addiction? How many people, how many demons, how many spirits have whispered in your ear that you're not good enough, that you don't deserve it, that you can't have it? But all you need to do is you need to let Jesus hear you one time shout. You need to let Jesus hear you, not the demons, not the naysayers. Don't keep it in. The power of life and death lies in our tongue. As our tongue goes, our life goes, the Scripture says. Our tongue is a rudder. It is steering us everywhere that we go. But he only shouted louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. And they said, They called the blind man, cheer up, they said. Come on. He's calling you. What have we sung tonight? He's calling us. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat. Daniel preached a beautiful message on this years ago. The coat of a blind man, of a beggar. The coat was a sign of dishonor. The coat was a distinction to let everybody know that they're a beggar that they don't belong with the normal people, that they don't belong where everybody else belongs, that they can't have what everybody else has, that they will never achieve what others have achieved. The coat was a signification to everybody and to the one wearing it that you are a loser, that you are not good enough. But Bartimaeus, he threw that coat off of himself. He jumped up to his feet, and he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. Whatever it is that you want, you need to put it right where that word see is. I want to be healed. I want to be set free. I want to have my marriage restored. I want my children back. I, I want my financial breakthrough. I want, I want my faith to arise to the level that I know it can be and it will be. I want whatever it is when you come to Jesus. He said, you have not because you ask not. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see. And he followed Jesus down the road. Look at the parallel of what happened in Jericho with Jesus compared to what happened to the Israelites thousands of years before. When they shouted, when they declared, when they gave a voice of triumph until the Lord, they saw their breakthrough. There's something in us not being embarrassed, us not worrying about anything else that's around us, but us standing for who we believe, what we believe. And if we need something bad enough, declaring it out, shouting it out, and declaring to Jesus because Jesus is calling. He's here and he's calling. To each and to every one of us, he's calling. I feel him calling me. It's time. It's time for Reach Church. It's time for Chris Gilkey. It's time to go to another level in him. It's time to see the glory of God in a way like we've never seen it. It's time to see the signs and wonders. It's time to see the promises of God. It's time to see the fullness of the book of Acts. I hear him. I hear him for my wife. It's time. The last 10 years are not going to dictate the rest of my wife's future. She will be the one that God has called her to be. She will be the one that God has designed her to be. And no sickness, no issue, no problem is going to stand in his way. Why? Because Jesus, he's calling. Jesus is calling. I'm going to ask if all of us can stand to our feet and the worship team could come back up on the platform. And we're going to go back into that worship song that Jesus is calling. And we're going to end tonight with communion as it's the first Wednesday. But before we get there, let me say this to you. I count this as an honor. I walk in the fear of God. When you hear your priest give you the word, then have all the people shout as loud as they can. Don't do it yet. Don't say a word. 
wait until it's time. Because we're going to press into this worship song, and I believe that God is going to begin to rock each and every one of us to the core of who we are. In this song, it says, come to the altar. I want you to know the altars are open. They're always open, but tonight, I want you, if you feel led, if you need a breakthrough, if you feel like there's something in your life that's holding you back or damaging your faith or keeping you from being the one that you know that you're called to be, if you need a miracle in your marriage, if you need a miracle in your children, whatever it is, I want you during this song just to come down, stand up front, bring your communion with you because we're going to do that. But before we go into the song, I'm going to ask just for a moment if we can just bow our head and close our eyes all over this auditorium because I want to be able to roll right in to communion. After this song. And before we could ever receive communion, we must receive Jesus. The Bible says if we take communion with sin in our heart, that we invite damnation upon our own lives. Jesus, he said, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save it. So many people have a hard time because religion has chased them away from the church. The scripture says that the church, the local church, is the hope to the world. Because the local church is the beacon of light of Jesus in the world. And I want you to know right now, right here, no matter what you've done, no matter what you said, no matter who you are, right here, right now, Jesus is calling. If you know in your heart you need to make some things right before God, if you've never prayed a prayer of salvation, if you've never experienced what it's like to have every sin, every mistake you've ever made be wiped out like it never happened, to have all that weight, all that guilt, all that shame just lifted off of you and be given a life of freedom, a life of joy, love, hope, faith. If you're here, You don't know that you know that you know that you are in the right standing with God. Maybe you've prayed a prayer, but you need to recommit that. Maybe there's some things in your life. It's not just a salvation thing, but maybe there's some things in your life you know you need to lay down at the feet of Jesus tonight. Then all of us, right here, right now, let's all have that open heart because Jesus, he's calling If that's you and you want to say yes to Jesus or you need to recommit that life or lay something at his feet, on the count of three, put your hand up nice and high in the air. We're going to pray a prayer with you right there where you're at. And then we're going to go right into this worship song. And we're going to end with communion. If that's you, on three, put that hand up nice and high without delay. One, hands are already going up. Two, three. Come on, nice and high. Come on. Hands are up all over. So many hands. Thank you. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being brave. Don't worry about anybody else. Don't worry about anything right now. Jesus is calling. He is calling you. He is calling you. If that's you and you're raising that hand, here's what I'm going to ask of you. I'm going to ask you to, I, I very rarely ever do this, but I hear the Holy Spirit telling me so clearly. There's some of you tonight, It's this is not just about salvation. You don't have to be embarrassed. Nobody's judging you. This is about you making whatever you need to be right with God, right with God. If you're raised that hand, come on out of your seat and join me down here. Don't worry about being embarrassed. Don't worry about anybody else. Just come on out and join me. Come on down to this altar. And anybody else that wants to come to the altar to worship, just everybody that feels led to do that, just come down to this altar. And let's sing this out. We're going to pray this prayer before we... Go into this song. Come on, everybody. Come on. We're going we're gonna to pray this prayer. Let me ask everybody in this place, let's just lift our hands towards Jesus. Everybody from front to back, left to right. Let's open our lives, open our heart. Let's give him a sign of surrender. And let's all say this where our own two ears can hear it. For those of you that said you need to make your life right with Jesus, you say it from the depths of your heart. Let's say it together. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. You are the Son of God. I give my life to you. You gave your life for me. Forgive me for every sin, every mistake I've ever made. Give me a fresh start, a new beginning. From this day forward, 
I dedicate my life to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Come on, let's worship God together. Come on. Yes, Jesus. You know what our horns are tonight? It's these guys right up here. You know how many there are of them up here tonight? There's seven of them up here tonight. Hear this and hear this clearly. I believe this is a prophetic moment for each and every one of our individual lives, but for this church as a whole. In just a moment, we're going to do communion, but before we do communion, we're going to declare a thing. Let me reread this scripture to you just so we have it fresh in our spirit. He says this, have all the people shout as loud as they can. And when they shout, the walls of the city will come down. Austin is ours. Cedar Park, Round Rock, Georgetown, Laga Vista, Jonestown. Hear me, Pflugerville, South Austin, East Austin, Colleen, Harker Heights, they're ours. Westlake, they're ours. This is the kingdom of the living God. The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent, they take it by force. We don't have to do it forcefully physically. We need to do it forcefully spiritually. It says this, when Joshua commanded the people to shout, and they shouted, the Lord has given you this city. I'm here to tell you tonight, Jesus is here. Jesus is calling. He is saying to each and every one of you, whatever that need is, whatever that one is, you get it ready in your belly. And when we shout this shout, I want that shout to represent that which you are believing for, that which you are needing, that which you are standing in faith for. And let's all together stand with each other and let's shout and bring down the walls that are keeping us from our destiny. Are you ready? On three, one. Two, three. Yes. Come on, shout it out. Come on. Yes. Give him a war cry. Yes. Jesus. Yes. Let's use our trumpet style and sing in the Lord. Come on. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ, that he is Lord. The heavens, they're roaring. The praise of his glory. Tonight the heavens are roaring with us. As we roar, the heavens roar. The Bible says in Romans that all creation eagerly awaits the manifestation, the coming to fullness of the sons and the daughters of God. Tonight the rocks will not cry out in our place. We will know that we have praised him with everything that we have. Amen? Can we give him just one more big love offering tonight I hope y'all brought your communion down here we're going to roll right into it if you didn't we can get it for you if you need one you need a communion let's start tossing them up here if we got some extra anybody else I want to just tell you guys real quick is we're going to close with amazing, amazing, not a tradition, not a religious act, but a spiritual moment. Jesus sat down with his disciples and he said the bread, it represents his body. And the juice, and this is juice, it represents his blood. His body was broken for our sake. The weight of the sin of the entire world came upon him. His blood was shed so that we may have joy. Not joy in the, in the, the world system, but joy knowing that he is ours and that we are his and that nothing is too big for God. He said that we should do this always in remembrance of him. I believe that's twofold. Not just do it always in the remembrance of him. Yes, that's one. But the other one is do it always. Do it always. And when you do it, 
do it in remembrance of him. The word communion means to come into unity with one. We are coming into unity with Jesus. Here's what I believe with all of my heart. When we partake of the wafer, our body, our soul, it is mended, it is healed. When we stand in faith and believe for them, and we partake of the juice, that the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. Wine was used in the old days. Wine in Scripture always represents the joy of the Lord. And the Scripture says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Don't go out and have too many wines tonight to get happy. But understand what God is saying to us spiritually. Here is a moment that we share together as a family, but a moment that we intimately share together with Jesus. I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing over it. And then we're going to receive it together as a family. Father, I thank you for a family that is in love with you. Jesus, you heard my prayer that when we shout, that you would come into every circumstance, every situation. We are garnishing your attention. We want you. We need you. We love you. We can't do this on our own. We're not here for a gathering's sake. We're here for your sake. And I pray that as we receive this communion together, that your word will be fulfilled, yes and amen. They will not fall void because you are faithful and you are true. And I pray that as we partake this, we come into a deeper unity with you. And all that need healed will be healed. And all that need set free would be free. And all that need joy would be filled from the top of their head to the sole of their feet. I pray today we would all walk out of here bubbling with the joy of the Lord. We receive it as we receive your communion together in your precious name. Amen. Let's receive together, family. Jesus, I thank you. All that I am is yours. All that I have is yours. All that I want is you. Lord, I pray that today we would walk out of here knowing that we know without a shadow of a doubt that we've encountered the most high God. That you are with us. And if you're with us, who can be against us? So I silence every enemy. I break every word curse spoken over everyone in this room. I silence every single spirit that is not of your spirit that is trying to intimidate your people. I silence them, Lord, even if it's just for one night. I declare what your scripture says in the Proverbs, Lord, that you will give sweet sleep to your people. I pray tonight that those that struggle with sleep would sleep like a baby. Lord, I pray tonight that couples would go home, they would lie in their bed, they would look at each other, and Lord, they would just declare your goodness. Yes. I pray, Father, yes. for every child that has walked away from you. Yes. I pray, Lord, with those parents, I stand in faith with them. Yes. They will return. Yes. I call them in now in the name of Jesus. I call them in now in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, God. I thank you that you have raised up a church in the midst of the most unreached city in America that wants to reach your people for you. I thank you for every Jesus-loving church. I thank you, God, for ARC and all the churches that they planted, including us and all the ones that we helped them to plant since and all the ones that will come, Lord. And I thank you, God, for the life-giving spirit that you have made relevant but also evident to each and every one. I pray, Lord, that you would never let us lose this fire, that we will walk out of here stronger and stronger and better and better. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Come on. I love you.
I love you from the bottom of my heart. Melissa and I are with you. We're praying for you. Be praying for us. I'm telling you. Just a quick praise report. I'm telling you. And the staff can attest to this. In the last two weeks, I've watched my wife slowly, slowly get up from that sickness. And in the last week, I've saw her standing, and she is still standing. And she is going to walk away and leave that sickness like blind Bartimaeus walked away. She's going to walk away and leave that sickness behind because Jesus is calling, and he is here. Amen? I love you guys. Thank you for your prayers. God bless you. We'll see you this weekend.